Hey, this is Brock Lemires. We're continuing our study of embedded systems design. We're starting a new chapter or module on what is called an interrupt. And so this chapter is going to cover a pretty new concept when it comes to computers, but one that is very important and used very uh, widely, especially in microcontrollers. So let's look back at polling as a way to kind of motivate why we need this new type of operation in a computer. So if you recall, polling was where you had a in your main program loop, <clears throat> you were waiting for some event to occur. And we looked at pressing a button, right? And so you never knew when the button was going to get pressed, but we knew that the button came in on a port. And so what we did was we just sat there and read the port over and over. We were just testing the bit that the button was connected to. And we just waited and waited and waited and waited. And <clears throat> then when it, it did get pressed, we would come out of there and then we noticed that with a button press, we actually had to, you know, put a little delay in there to allow the person to remove their finger. And then we'd come back into the main polling loop and just sit there and wait. So this was very inefficient because we never knew when this external event was going to occur. And so we wasted a lot of CPU cycles just sitting there as fast as we could go checking it. OK, so it was inefficient in terms of like the use of our CPU cycles. But it was also inefficient because we couldn't do anything else. We weren't we weren't checking, uh, you know, we weren't processing data. We weren't doing anything. We were just sitting there checking. And so the issue becomes when you look at a microcontroller, you have more than just somebody who might press a button on a on a port. You're going to have a whole bunch of peripherals that sit outside of the CPU that can do things. OK, so you're going to have <clears throat> timers and analog to digital converters and serial interfaces. <clears throat> and each of these kind of have that same characteristic that they operate independent of the CPU main loop, and you just never know when they, when things are going to occur. And so we need a different way to handle this. And the way we do this is with what's called an interrupt. And so it's IRQ is the the little nickname for an interrupt. But what is what this is is it's an approach to dealing with external asynchronous events by building hardware into the MCU that, that can identify what happened, prioritize which one needs to be taken care of first, and then run some sort of program or service routine within the CPU that handles whatever action you want to take. Okay, And so this is the whole idea here. All right. Now, when things occur, the way that this works is that you have the CPU sitting over here, and it's doing its thing. It might be processing data. It might be doing something. It might actually a lot of times just be sitting in a low power mode. So you might just just say, OK, get in your main loop and just go into low power mode and wait for something to happen. The something that's going to happen is an interrupt will occur. And so the way that uh, this all is kind of put together is using this concept of flags. So if you think about it, you've got the ports out here, you've got serial I.O., you've got all these peripherals that sit outside of the CPU and they can notify the CPU that something has happened. Okay, and that they request attention. So uh, a timer might be, well, yeah, yeah, a certain amount of time has passed, or a serial I.O. might be, somebody just sent in some data. But you never know when it's going to happen. It's very, you know, asynchronous to the clock of the CPU. And so you never really know when it's going to happen. So what, what you do is you set this up to say, hey, guys, if something happens out there, go ahead and just raise a flag. And then what I'll do is I'll check periodically and just make sure that that nothing has happened. OK, so it's not necessarily polling. It's basically what happens is that after every instruction is executed, it'll take a quick check and see if anybody out here has has raised a flag and then it'll continue. So if you look at kind of the the fetch decode uh, execute state machine in the control unit, it starts looking more like this. So we have fetch, decode, and then depending on the instruction, you kind of have these different paths. But after each one is executed, it just takes a quick peek and says, anybody out there raise a flag? Oh, no. OK. So then it continues executing, continues executing, continues executing. And then if somebody did raise a flag, it'll say, oh, check this out. I'm going to go over here and I might do something specific to take care of a situation or add some functionality for that. And so in this way, you're not polling, right? It's you're just a quick check as you're executing each time through. So it's just a quick state and, and doesn't impact performance hardly at all. And it's a nice way to just handle these external asynchronous events. Okay, a key to this though is the term interrupt 
you might think, wow, it just immediately stops. It's like, it, no, it does not. It will, the CPU completes its current instruction, okay? So you never like have this thing going fetch, decode, and then all of a sudden someone says, hey, something happened on a timer, let's go handle it. And it's like, no, 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 no. It would screw the computer up if you, if you like halted this during midway through an instruction execution. So what happens is that you always execute the current instruction and complete it. And so then you're done and you're at a nice spot and you're gonna say, I'm going to the next instruction now. So then you come up, quick peek, did anything happen? No, okay, let's go fetch, decode, and then execute. So you always complete the current instruction. And, and that's a theme that we'll keep repeating as we look at this. It's an interrupt because it stems from the fact that if you are sitting here executing some code, so you have a main program and you're looking at data, you're altering data, et cetera, et cetera, it does interrupt the flow of the instruction. Okay, so you're sitting here in your main fetch, decode, execute loop, and you're doing the main loop, and it completes it. And if something did happen out here on the peripherals, it would indeed say, you know what, I'm going to stop the computer, the main foreground operation for, for a second, and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do something. I'm going to add some functionality that handles whatever peripheral may have uh, requested service, okay? All right. Now, this becomes highly efficient because the CPU does not sit and pull the flags. It doesn't sit in a loop and just say, was there a flag? Was there a flag? Was there a flag? Was there a flag? It is continuing operation. It just does a quick peek each time through. And the peek where it says, was there a flag? Doesn't, it's not pulling it. It just looks at it and continues. And it's like a decision path. Okay. So that's, that's a key thing is that the fetch, decode, execute is always operating. You're not binding up the CPU because you're observing flags. Okay, let's talk about uh, a little bit of terminology. Interrupt service routine, ISR. This is going to be a, a chunk of code that you will write that will what we call service or handle the interrupt. Okay, so if I go back and I look at this, <clears throat> if an event happens on a timer or a serial I.O. or whatever, you're going to have a dedicated functionality that you want to occur to handle that, that event. Okay, whatever it is, and it's going to be unique to whatever application you have. Maybe you just have a, a timer or hits a certain time, you want to toggle an LED. Maybe every time <clears throat> someone sends information, you want to send information back. Okay, so it's always unique to whatever you're trying to do. But you are going to write that as just a chunk of code. And so it's, it's very similar to a subroutine in that you write it, okay? And it does sit within your program memory. So, you know, you look at like a, a normal program, you have your main program loop, you're gonna have some subroutines. And then after that, you're gonna write some interrupt service routines. So these ISRs. And then these will execute when one of these interrupts occurs and sets a flag and the CPU says, oh, check it out, something happened. I'm gonna go ahead and execute this. Uh, it, it's also called an interrupt handler, which means this is the code that's handling the interrupt. And a couple terms that we have. So servicing the, uh, the IRQ, that refers to when the CPU is not in the fetch decode execute state anymore. It has now moved into action where it is servicing the interrupt service routine. And you'll see as we go through this that there's more steps than just pop, you know, jumping down here and, and executing this subroutine as if it was like a subroutine, executing this code and then jumping back to the main program. There's, there's more steps involved in it. Uh, and so we say when the CPU moves out of this fetch, decode, execute, it's actually taking a, a direction in the state machine over here to do something. That's called servicing the IRQ. When an IRQ has raised a flag, but the CPU has not gotten around to servicing it, we say that the IRQ is pending. And that is perfectly acceptable because if you think about it, you could raise a flag while the control unit was moving through a fetch decode execute cycle and it is not done with its current instruction. So you have an interrupt that has occurred and they raised a flag. So the timer says, hey, I'm, I need something. And the CPU says, well, I'm not even going to look at you until I get done with my current instruction. Then I'll take a peek. And so when that's happening, when you have the CPU doing its normal operation while a flag has been raised by one of the peripherals, you have what's called a pending interrupt. Okay. <clears throat> now, the CPU has hardware that is designed in the control state machine 
to handle interrupts. So now you look at this fetch decode execute state machine. Now we are actually adding in kind of this additional path that takes care of what to do when a interrupt occurs. And I want to highlight this because once again, it's this isn't magic that you're adding to the hardware of the CPU. This was pre-designed by the designers of the CPU architecture. They said, I have a fetch decode execute state machine. I'm also going to add in paths to handle interrupts. And it will do all these different things to handle all the different types of interrupts that can occur. Okay. And you know, the interrupt sources can be anything, you know, timers, resets, port shocks, but all of these are built into the CPU hardware and that knows what to do. So it's actual hardware through the finite state machine. Okay. Now, there are a lot of different interrupts, but not all interrupts are, are created equal. So you have this notion of priority. So priority is important because it is very possible for multiple interrupts to occur at the same time, or even if they don't occur at the same time, they might happen close to each other so that when the CPU gets around to checking, the CPU sees two or more flags. And if you go, well, I got to service both of these, and you, you know the CPU isn't designed to do both at the same time, who goes first? And so there's things that are more important than others. And, you know, you can obviously think about a reset. Okay, a reset is actually an interrupt. And it is more important than anything else. Okay, if you're sitting there and you need to do a reset, that means something has drastically gone wrong, power cycled it. You got to handle that. You got to make sure that you're actually running before you can do something like toggle an LED. So all of the all of the peripherals and all of the other built-in things like reset have priority. And you and this is just a rough idea of kind of the lowest to highest priority, you know, timers are higher priority than ports, for example. And it will always handle, the CPU will always handle the interrupt that is pending with the highest priority. So if you had a timer interrupt for example and a port interrupt that both raised their flag and said, "Hey, I need some service over here." the CPU would say, I'm going to do the timer first. Then when I'm done with that, I can do the ports. Okay, so then you can absolutely have multiple ones of these uh, pending, <clears throat> and then you, you know, handle them in the order. Okay, now this is an interesting one. Interrupts can interrupt other interrupts. So it is possible that let's say that you had a port interrupt, and it was being serviced. So you were like, you, you know, somebody pressed a button, and you were doing a whole bunch of stuff to respond to that button press. And while you were doing that, a timer interrupt went off. It is possible to set this up so that the timer interrupt can interrupt the lower priority one. Uh, so I'll just say that flat out. It is possible. But there are some, some I don't know, some advice we give you <laughs> that, that we will talk about as we go. So sometimes you can't prevent it, but sometimes you want to avoid it. And we'll talk about that as we go. Okay, let's look at the three types of, of interrupts, the three categories. So there's these groups of, of interrupts. First and foremost <clears throat> are the resets. Now, there's, there's actually more than one reset. There's the power on reset, which is kind of makes sense when you, <clears throat> you know, you turn the board on. That's, you just powered the thing up. It needs to know what to do. And so you're gonna, you have to have some, some events that occur in order to get all configured and put the program counter at the first instruction of your program. But there's also other ones like uh, external reset. So that's actually the button. Right, so that's the reset button that you press, and and that's different from a power on reset, <clears throat> and and so that's a that is a reset. And then there's like power supply monitor violations. So you have like if, if the power supply is going down or something, there's there's all these things that can happen that require you to say, you know what, it's it's over. Just flush everything, reset all the configuration registers, and let's just put the program counter back at the first instruction in memory and start over. So those are called resets. They are the highest priority. They're always enabled, and it and that what they do <clears throat> is literally reset all the all the registers and put the program counter back to in our example eight thousand, the first instruction of memory. So always on, <clears throat> always <laughs> they can interrupt anybody. They can interrupt every, anybody else because they're gonna just say everybody else is done. Uh, we're flushing all the memory and we are going back to eight thousand. Okay, and then that's important where the starting address in the main program is. That's really all it does. <clears throat> then there's ones called non-maskable interrupts. Non-maskable means you can't turn them off. But at the same time, they are going to execute a developer written interrupt service routine. 
And this is a little different from a, from a reset. So when a reset occurs, you don't actually execute a interrupt service routine. <clears throat> all you do is you put, you reset all the registers and you put the starting address of the program in the program counter. Non-maskable interrupts, they are high priority in that they're the second highest priority group, but they do execute a developer written ISR. So you do, if you want to respond to one of these non-maskable interrupts, you need to absolutely write an ISR. Now, examples of this would be something, these are like critical faults that have occurred. <clears throat> so for example, you, you had a memory access error where you went out to read from memory and nothing happened, like there was no response. That's a critical problem. <clears throat> it's not something like, oh, let's toggle an LED. It's like, we have an issue. We need to like do something significant. So you have, a, there's a fault. So you handle it with an interrupt. Another one might be an oscillator fault. Let's say the clock for one of these peripherals just hasn't been turned on or, or it isn't operating anymore. And you're like, well, this is horrible. We need to start powering down parts of the MCU and repower them. And so that's what non-maskable interrupts are is there's, they're critical hardware faults, <clears throat> but they're different from resets in that you don't just flush everything out. You write an ISR to try to recover from them. Okay. And then we get to the third category, which is maskable interrupts. And this is where we spend most of our time because these are the peripherals. So these are interrupts that are for the ports and the timers and the serial interface and the A to D and the D to A. And so these are the ones that we actually use most because resets are kind of simple. You just say, all I need to do for a reset is make sure that <clears throat> the program goes to the first instruction in my memory and it's set up. Non-maskable interrupts, you know, sometimes you don't even set them up. You just say, well, this is a real low impact design. So I don't care if, if there's a hardware fault, I just want to reset. <clears throat> so maybe you, you handle it that way. But maskable interrupts are where you're setting up all the functionality that is really cool in an MCU. All right. <clears throat> now, what does it mean to be maskable? Well, maskable means that you can turn it on or off. And it turns out that in our MCU, they're all off. So they are all off by default. And so you need to enable which ones you want to use. And a timer by itself just doesn't have one. It has many, many. I mean, there's dozens and dozens of these that can be turned on within a timer for different functionalities. And so they each have this concept of a local interrupt <clears throat> and a global interrupt, okay? And the way to think about it is this picture right here where you have a global interrupt, which is one bit, and it sits in the status register. And if you turn that on, that gives you the ability to then turn on individual maskable interrupts, okay? but the global handles everything. It's the GIE bit in the CPU. Then every single peripheral has its own individual interrupt enable bit that sits within a configuration register associated with the peripheral. The global interrupt enable, it is a bit in the status register and you can set it and clear it using instructions that are provided. So you have EINT for enable interrupts and DINT, which means disable up interrupts. <clears throat> and their instructions. So if you're going to use a, a timer interrupt, you need to enable its local and then turn on all maskable interrupts. And when you turn it on, that doesn't mean all of them are going to happen. It just means that you're allowing maskable interrupts to occur. Now, each, each peripheral <laughs> also has a local interrupt enable. And you go every single one of them. And it's like, yes. So every time you go to turn on one of these, like a timer peripheral, you have to go in the data sheet, read about it, figure out how it works, and then you gotta find which bit in which configuration register you need to assert in order for that thing to be enabled. And once it's enabled, then it's going. And then from then on out, it can raise flags and be handled by the CPU. <clears throat> okay, so that was a brief overview of interrupts and their importance and how to prioritize and enable them. And that's it. So remember, support my channel by subscribing and I'll talk to you later. See ya.